to talk about web application security, uh, both about uh, a little bit about how we sometimes see vulnerabilities out in the wild. And, um, when it comes to Rails, it's got its own history of uh, types of stuff that has been lurking out there that, that people have been caught by. Uh, but also, uh, sort of like a new approach to how we can uh, defend against these types of uh, security vulnerabilities that we see. So, when we're talking about uh, security attacks, uh, they have two aspects that lend themselves to be uh, defended against. So the first is you've got a vulnerability. Here it's someone who posts online that uh, they're going to be away for vacation. Uh, and then you've got an attacker uh, who you know, <laughs> might want to do something with that information. So what we generally see are uh, defense approaches that try to counterattack either attackers or vulnerabilities. So how do we defend against vulnerabilities? Well, a lot of what we do is based around policies. We go through, we audit all our source code, we try to understand what our dependencies are, what gems we're using, and we look for CVEs, which are uh, bulletins put out about uh, security updates uh, that you know, might be found in specific gems. So you try to stay on top of those, and if you happen to use a gem that has a security vulnerability, you try and get an update, patch it, release it, so on. Uh, it ends up being a cycle you go through, it's kind of annoying. Uh, and you know, this is, this is Ruby, and so we might as well rag on, on some other language first. Um, so PHP, they have, on average, in their total existence, they have had on average over 24 vulnerabilities reported every year. Uh, but, you know, we, we are talking about uh, Ruby and, and Rails, for example, which is just one framework in Ruby. That, in its, in its existence, has had over seven vulnerabilities on average each year. And given that it can take uh, a, a good amount of developer time to go through and actually track down, audit source code and gems, uh, find where there's uh, vulnerabilities, patch them, test them, deploy them and everything, it becomes a question of how fast can you spin this wheel? So that's about the vulnerabilities that we actually find out about through some kind of disclosure. What about some of the vulnerabilities that aren't publicly disclosed? Well, there's been some research showing that vulnerabilities that are sold uh, privately, say to usually bad guys of some sort, uh, they remain undetected uh, or at least unreported for over 150 days. And so that by the time you, by the time someone sees them, and then you, as a as a developer somewhere, uh, learns about it and gets it patched and deployed, you're talking about probably a half a year before a vulnerability that someone has bought and has been using, uh, you actually get a, a, a chance to defend against it. And of course, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that are lurking that no one has found yet. Neither the good guys or the bad guys. Uh, they're just out there. So defending against vulnerabilities is something we, we need to do. We need to stay on top of things and, and uh, you know, try to uh, uh, prevent security holes when we know about them. But it's not a total solution. So then we start to look at you know, how do we defend against the attacker half of the puzzle. So uh, uh, one of the main routes that people use is something called a, a web application firewall. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it doesn't mean you've got a Harrison Ford in a box uh, that you put in your data center. Um, instead, it's, it's this complex piece of, it's usually hardware, there's some software as a service companies. Uh, they basically look at the networking layer for the traffic that comes into your, your web app. And they use a lot of sophisticated filtering tools based uh, a lot on uh, pattern detection. And so you go through, you get one of these boxes, and you have to configure them for your application. And so you have to set up a bunch of rules and say like, okay, well, uh, people should be able to access this page when they're logged in and have a valid session. And uh, people shouldn't be able to access this page unless they're an admin, and you know, all, these, all these rules. Uh, and it's very complex. And so what ends up happening is the only people who can actually uh, use these, uh, this type of equipment 
which itself is usually very expensive, uh, are, are companies that can afford to have a security engineering presence, a, a department or at least <coughs> one engineer, but usually many times. So it's kind of an, an expensive endeavor. But all this configuration leads to another problem, which is you have to configure it right. So uh, uh, I'm going to take a, a field trip to a place called Castle Gaillard. It's, uh, it's an interesting analogy because the idea was uh, back around like the 1100s, uh, this castle uh, was uh, a castle in Normandy, uh, where we now obviously call France. Uh, but it was under the control of the uh, British king. And of course, the French king wasn't happy with it. So uh, he sent his army to siege it and, and try and take it back. And uh, there's a lot of things that they did. But one of the key things they did was they found a garderobe. And a garderobe is a fancy term for a medieval toilet. You sit on the top of the tower, uh, the castle walls, and you do your thing, and the waste drops down to the outside of the walls. Uh, so in uh, what is probably one of their finest hours, uh, some Frenchmen, uh, or yeah, some Frenchmen realized, well, why don't we just scale the garter robe and get ourselves inside the castle through the toilet? And so that's what they did, and through the element of surprise, uh, they were able to um, open the drawbridge, allow the entire French army to come in, and take over the castle. So uh, I, I use this as an analogy because web application firewalls, they, are so, they can be so difficult to configure, especially the larger your website is, uh, that it's hard to lock everything down. Uh, hackers typically start with tools that are these very sophisticated um, uh, sort of spidering types of, of software. They go through, they'll run it against a website, and kind of like the Google bot, which crawls the web for all these links from one page to another page, they'll do the same thing for a given site. And when they're on every page, they'll look for uh, forms, places that they can try and provide some kind of input, login forms. Uh, maybe you help it by creating an account so that it can log in and then start to poke in further. And so once they've got a catalog of all these forms, all these places that it can reach on uh, a website, it then goes into a separate mode where it tries to inject into all these forms all these different types of payloads that could try to uh, do uh, SQL injection or cross-site scripting, uh, lots of different types of security vulnerabilities that are sort of uh, very typical things uh, that people tend to be vulnerable to somewhere in their app. So these automated tools, they take some time on the order of a few hours. Uh, it's not a lot of time, realistically. Uh, and so you can have this setup, this web application firewall, that you try and configure as much as possible, but the attackers, they're probably going to find some way into your system. So when they find a way into your system, that's called a false negative in the security field. There's a, there's a sort of an opposite problem, and that's the, the problem of false positives. So that's where you have your, your security solution warning you of an attack that hasn't actually occurred. Um, and the reason that this is pretty much just as uh, problematic as a false negative uh, you might say to yourself, well, it's okay. I mean, if, if no one can get in, I, who cares if I'm getting alerted a lot? Uh, the problem is that usually you, need to, you want to do something when you find that someone is attacking your site. Uh, for example, if you find that it's the same user account that is trying to do a bunch of uh, malicious uh, attempts uh, to, to hack your site, you probably want to, to deactivate that account. Or maybe you think that it's a stolen account, you want to reset their password or something. So you need to, usually you need to do something actionable with this data. And if you have a lot of false positives, it becomes difficult to do something actionable, either because it's too hard to keep up with it, to filter out the good stuff from the bad stuff, or because potentially you trust it too much and you start deactivating perfectly fine accounts where people are doing legitimate activities, but your tool uh, is, is warning about things that, that really are, are benign. So 
This is kind of the lay of the land as we have today. We've got, we're trying to defend against vulnerabilities and attackers, and it's, you know, it's certainly, you know, better than nothing. Uh, it does a lot of good, but it's clearly not quite a, a complete solution. So if we, if we step back and, and we think a bit more, there's actually a, a third piece to what comprises a security attack. And that's the actual exploitation. So you may have a vulnerability, you may have an attacker, uh, in this case it's you know, someone, a, a burglar, but he's not gonna enter your house to plop down on the couch, watch some TV for a bit, and then walk out, and that's it. He's gonna actually do something, he's gonna try and steal some of your jewels, perhaps. Um, another analogy, you know, you've got the famous scene from uh, Indiana Jones, where there's, he's trying to steal this uh, statue inside of a temple. And you can, you can rationalize, okay, it's a temple. Maybe, maybe people are meant to be able to come and, and, and view the statue, maybe pray to it or whatnot. And so you've got this inherently vulnerable statue. Uh, it's hard to identify attackers because even in this case, Indiana Jones looks like an archeologist and yet he is trying to steal the statue. So it's, it's difficult to identify attackers, so instead they use an approach of a booby trap. So can we apply the same approach to security uh, where we are attempting to uh, prevent the actual exploitation that is possible through having a vulnerability and attacker? And that's kind of what I've labeled uh, a meta-security approach. So I want to talk about two example exploitations, uh, vulnerabilities that we see in uh, Ruby and Rails apps, and then show how we can try to apply this meta-security approach to them. Uh, so SQL injection and cross-site scripting. So uh, who here knows uh, something about SQL injection? All right, a pretty good amount. That's, that's good stuff. Um, I'm going to try and, and quickly run through it. Uh, so, so bear with me for the people who do know. Um, it's basically a, a vulnerability uh, where you can, an example here of what not to do is you generate a query where you're interpolating some parameters into a string and you execute it. So it works fine if the parameter is like the number five here, which is what we want it to be. We're going to select the user who, whose ID is, is five. Uh, but if we send the parameter in as five or one equals one, all of a sudden we've selected all the users in the table, and maybe we're returning all that data out from the website. If we say it's five semicolon drop table users, then we've got a huge problem because now we no longer have any users. So that's how you can get SQL injection. Um, in the real world, we see this in slightly less trivial uh, ways. Here's someone who is trying to do a, a delete all. Again, they're interpolating a parameter into the string condition. And you can find yourself in a place where you are deleting all your users. It's still somewhat artificial. A lot of people understand that you shouldn't be interpolating string values uh, to generate your queries. So let's look at something else. Here we've got a... Uh, a calculate message, and we're passing in uh, a column, which we got as the parameter from like a form on the website. And it seems, you might think to yourself, okay, I'm, I'm passing it in, not as a string interpolated value or anything, it's, it's just, a, it, it's a column parameter. Surely uh, Active Record is going to uh, sanitize this for me. And uh, the, the scary truth is um, that in uh, at least some versions, it, it does not. Um, and so here, instead of like, you, know, you might pass in that the, you want to uh, calculate the sum of all uh, prices in all the orders, all of a sudden you're able to get the sum of all ages from all users. Uh, this is kind of a, a tricky case where you use the combination of how uh, a web form data could be passed in as a query string uh, and then gets uh, evaluated by Rails and then gets passed into exists and you can have a situation where uh, exists will always return true no matter what. Um, here's one last example where you know it's, it's possible to construct something where the parameter is in such a way that you're trying to find a user and instead you've made him an administrator. 
Uh, and so these are all kind of cases where you can find yourself trying to do the right thing in Rails, uh, and uh, yet you still open yourself up to a vulnerability. Um, so before I get to how we can solve this, I want to quickly go through the other vulnerability that I'm going to talk about, uh, and that's cross-site scripting. Uh, who knows about cross-site scripting? All right, cool, a little bit less. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit harder to, to um, kind of wrap your head around, because you have to think about the request response cycle, sometimes over multiple requests. Um, but I'll try and explain a little bit quickly. Uh, let's say you've got a, like a social networking site, and it's got a sign-up form. And so you sign in, and then the, on every page, maybe in the top right corner, it displays your, your first and your last name back to you. Let's say that there is a cross-site scripting vulnerability in how the website renders the, displays back the last name of a user. So here, I'm going to put in a, a script tag, an HTML script tag, uh, that shows a, an alert box as my last name. Well, when I log in, if I've got a cross-site scripting vulnerability, uh, I'm now going to be presented with my first name, and it's going to actually render as a literal script tag uh, my last name, which is going to pop up a dialog box. So that's not cool, but you might say to yourself, okay, but you just harmed yourself. You're just going to have pop-up uh, dialog boxes on your own pages. And yeah, that's true, but uh, let's talk about the possibility that this is a social network. Someone has created a, a post. You go in and, and you go and with your malicious account, you start commenting on posts that they have. And uh, when you comment on their posts, it's going to start putting in your name in those comments. So then someone else on their computer comes along, they pull up this post, and now they're going to see my name and they're going to get these pop-ups. And they're going to wonder what the hell's going on. So again, you're like, okay, well, you're just doing pop-ups. But that's because I'm being a nice hacker here. Uh, if I were an evil hacker, I might try to get some, uh, uh, some really interesting data. Maybe I would get some sessions, uh, session IDs, uh, which I could then use through an a AJAX request, because I'm in JavaScript on the page. I could send that off to my own server, where I'm collecting sessions. And now with the session, I can log in as whoever the user was that I got the session from, uh, which is scary for a social networking site. It's obviously even worse for like a banking website. Uh, so, so it's kind of it's kind of serious stuff. So, how do we how do we find how do we come across these cross -script scripting vulnerabilities? How do we get into apps? To do that, we need to talk about something called HTML safe. HTML safe is kind of a misnamed method. Uh, it makes it sound like you take a string and you call the method on it, and it makes it safe. Yay! Um, that's unfortunately not the case. What it does is it wraps that string in something called a, an active support safe buffer. Anything inside of a safe buffer is an indication to Rails that this is actually safe to put directly into HTML that goes out the door. Okay, so how is that useful? Well, Later on, let's say you take a safe buffer and you try to append some more HTML stuff into it as a regular string. Well, it's going to escape the stuff that you add to the safe buffer. And if you take a safe buffer and you add another safe buffer, it's going to allow the second safe buffer to go through uh, unescaped. So this may be confusing as to you know, why this really matters. Um, so to explain that, we have to look at Rails rendering. So when you're rendering a template, like an ERB template or a Haml template, you got, like an ERB case, you got a bunch of HTML with some expressions that get interpolated into it. So you start with an empty safe buffer. That's what's at the bottom of the screen here. There's nothing there. We take some of what's in the template, the literal stuff, and we wrap it inside of a safe buffer and we append it to our rendering buffer. Because it was already wrapped in a safe buffer, it goes in without any escaping. But now I'm, I'm an, a, a hacker, and I somehow got my, uh, my own input into the title method. So I have tried to inject uh, an, another alert dialog box. Well, here, 
the title method returns a string with my script tag. When that gets appended to the safe buffer, it gets escaped so that it's safely rendered out to the user uh, as this HTML escaped goop that gets shown like visually in the page uh, appropriately. So that's cool. Uh, we start adding more stuff like this uh, ending title. Now we get to another interesting thing, which is uh, the JavaScript include tag method inside of an expression. Well, here we're trying to, to get a script tag into the web page. So we actually want that to go through uh, in an unescaped form. So the JavaScript include tag method is special in that it returns a safe buffer. So the safe buffer from the JavaScript include tag, when appended to the safe rendering buffer, goes through unescaped. And we finish off with the ending of our head tag. So that's how uh, Rails renders uh, a template uh, attempting to uh, properly escape uh, unsafe input. So that seems reasonable. So how, how are we getting uh, a script tag in here? Well, let's, let's talk about what happens in the real world. You don't have to read this code. Um, right? But this code comes from a gem that actually has a security vulnerability in it. This gem is, uh, it, it provides a helper for showing flash messages uh, on your website. So someone wanted to use this gem. So they, in, in their show method, uh, they, uh, they added a flash under some conditions where uh, they wanted to show that the user ID 5 does not exist when the ID parameter is the number 5. Uh, and this is all cool. It, it works great if you try to uh, pass in a script tag as your ID, because you're a hacker. Uh, you know, we expect and we, we want to see uh, that it gets properly escaped so that at worst case you get user ID script alert as text does not exist rather than the script actually being evaluated. So that's how it's supposed to work. And that's how it did work at first. But then someone else came along with a different app, a second app, and they wanted to have a link inside of their flash, flash message. And uh, they tried to do this, and, and they were they were perplexed. They're like, "Well, wait a minute, it's it's escaping it. So, like, how is this? This isn't useful. This, you know, we need to. There's something wrong with the gem." And so they went upstream to the gem, and they said, "Aha! The gem is passing my message into the content tag, and so that's where it's getting escaped. Uh, what I what I should do is I should just I should mark the message as, as safe. I should wrap it in a safe buffer so that it goes straight out the door without any escaping. And that's awesome, you know, like yay, we've got we fixed the bug. Uh, but then the first guy comes around, he's updated his app, he did a bundle update, uh, I can't remember what the name of this gem is, let's say it's the flash helper gem. And all of a sudden he realizes, well wait a minute, now I can put the a script tag into my ID parameter and it renders out and it actually executes. And so he's not very happy. So this is a case of how completely unbeknownst to you as an application developer, a gem that you rely on could have someone with perfectly good meaning intentions be subverted to add a cross-site scripting vulnerability. In reality, what the second person should have done is whenever you're going to wrap some, some text in a safe buffer, the person who, know, who is generating the text is the only person who can safely know if it's secure to do that or not. The gem that provides the flash helper does not know what's in that message. It cannot vouch for the safety of what's in that string. So the, the second application developer should have said, I know that the HTML I'm putting in here is, is just a link. It's just going to create an A tag. So he should have put HTML safe in his code. All right, so I'm done with the overview of, of SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Let's get into the, the interesting stuff. How are we going to solve these problems? Uh, well, you know, we could sit back and be like, uh, how, do we, how do we fix this? Is, do we really want to fix this? Yeah, okay, we probably should fix this. 
Uh, okay, you know, let's go through our, let's look for CVEs. X assess one came through as a, as a CVE, so we can, we can update it. It's very retroactive. Um, SQL injection, you know, we, we can sort of defend against that by knowing a bunch of rules. Uh, it, it gets kind of complex, um, but surely, you know, someone on the team can learn that. Um, that, and then that person, he gets, he gets called into the boss's office for doing that, and they say, okay, well that's awesome. Once you're done with that, can you audit all of our uh, dependencies too? And you say, well, yes. Uh, and uh, then he says, oh, awesome, you, you audited all our dependencies. Can you now teach everyone else on the team about security? Because we've, like we've got like new interns starting in a week, and we don't want them you know, like, to add any issues too. And, and you reluctantly agree, and then, then you know, a month later, and um, on some advice from someone else, your your boss comes and says, "Okay, well, I've, I've made another decision. We're, we're 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 hiring two security engineers. All changes are going to be reviewed by them. Don't worry, it won't be a bottleneck. You know, we've got a large code base, but it's two security engineers. And if one of them goes on vacation, we've still got the other. You know, um, and these just aren't aren't decent ways of, of dealing with this. So." What can we do uh, trying to like apply the idea of meta security, blocking against the exploitation? So if we look at cross-site scripting, where where should we care about when we look at this template? Where can we get a cross-site scripting uh, attack? And unless you're doing something really crazy with your literal HTML in your template, it's it's wherever you're you have expressions that are being evaluated. So we can ask ourselves, should there be script tags here? Um, how, how can we answer that question, though? Because I mean, it's it's easy as a human, but how, how does a how can a computer answer that question? Well, um, one thing we could do is we could wrap the HTML safe method. So now that we're kind of wrapping the HTML safe method, we are we're going to have some code that is going to be executed every time some other code calls HTML safe. So we have a lot of information. Um, what, could we, what could we do with that information? Well, we could see if it's been called from locations that are known good locations. So like a, a Rails helper, JavaScript include tag. Uh, there's, relatively speaking, few places that, through few help, helpers through which a script tag should be injected into a web page. Uh, it's very rare that someone is generating a script tag manually. And when they are, they really ought to be using uh, a helper like content tag or script tag anyways. So if we're called through a known good location, like a Rails helper, like content tag or, or script tag, we let it through unimpeded. Uh, but otherwise, we should escape uh, any and all script tags uh, before they go out the door. So that's one way to defend against uh, one vector of cross-site scripting. Uh, if we talk about the, the SQL injection issue, uh, this is the, some of the initial stuff that I said was like the worst way you could do things, string interpolation where you're passing it into like find by SQL. Uh, but we can still do something with this. So all these queries, they have a, a structure associated with them. So you can tokenize a query. So here, every token in the query, like select is one token, star is another token, from is another token, becomes uh, a letter in a fingerprint. So now we've got like a, an expectation of what the structure should look like. It should always look like that top one, ELK, NK, and one uh, if it looks like something else, then it, it's probably something funky. Uh, but, but how do we determine what an expected structure is for a given query? Well, every query that is made is effectively made through a specific code path in an application. And one representation of this is a, is a stack trace. So, at the very top of the stack trace is where the query actually is executed inside of the SQLite 3 uh, adapter in Rails. But it includes uh, extremely useful information like 
it was called from line 12 in, this is actually part of our test stat code, we have a, a SQL I controller. I don't recommend writing a SQL I controller. Um, so this is, it, it includes the fact that it came from uh, line 12 of our SQL I controller, which happens to have this, this query at the bottom, where we're looking for cars of a specific make. So we can start to learn and match up, okay, well, we've got stack trace. Uh, if we see queries coming from this stack trace, we know it's got an expected stack structure. So we can learn that. And if in the real world, we get another query that comes in with the same structure, it's, it's, it's good. If it comes in with a different structure, we're probably wondering to ourselves, yeah, this, this doesn't look right. Uh, and we can, we can block it, uh, and we can respond with a 403. So these are kind of like uh, the, the foundations of what we can do for uh, you know, two common uh, vulnerabilities, cross-site scripting and SQL injection. Uh, so it gets back to, let's try and block uh, security problems, attacks, not at the attacker level or at the vulnerability level, not that we shouldn't do those, those are, those are good things to do, uh, but there's definitely a lot that we can do at the exploitation level uh, that can be beneficial. So I'm working at a, a, a place called Immunio, and uh, we're, we're basically trying to use this technique, this meta security principle, apply it to a whole host of uh, attacks um, that we see in the wild. Uh, and we, uh, it's been a fun ride. We launched at RailsConf uh, a month and a half ago. Uh, it's, uh, we've got uh, a lot of cool people using our stuff, and we would love to have even more. So if you have any interest, you work at a shop, you have your own personal site, you want to uh, play around with our stuff, we would love to talk with you. Um, you know, come find me tonight. Uh, and, and I'll help get you set up, uh, and uh, that's all. Um, I want to thank Kristen for, for getting me in here, uh, and uh, thanks for, for listening.